today we're going to be looking at the poem Wild Grapes by Kenneth Slessor. Um, before we start going into this in detail, I want you to think back to a time in your life where you may have returned somewhere that you had been previously in your life and you hadn't been there in a long time. So it could be a place you visited when you were much younger. It could be a town or location that you used to live. And when you've gone to that particular location, it has brought about memories of that place. Okay, because if we're really looking at the overall picture of this poem, it is a persona who is returning to an orchard that they used to go to when they were much younger and looking at how that has changed since they had previously been there, but also looking at the memories of that time and how those memories have changed or how the perception of those memories and those times have changed since that time. I feel like I'm going to say time a lot, but um, we'll get there. So you can see here we have a list of all the different devices. Now there often can be more examples of these throughout the poem. So if you happen to notice any and you want to annotate further, then certainly go ahead and do that. So it is important to remember that you can pause this video at any time to make sure that you are writing down any of the additional annotations. So obviously you want to be highlighting uh, any of these techniques, but you also want to be writing down around the poem any of the additional information that I am presenting to you. I will be talking about it stanza by stanza, so you can either pause it at each point or obviously after each stanza, depending on how fast you can make those notes and what you need to do. So let's start off with the title of the poem itself. So the title here um, becomes an extended metaphor for what is explored throughout the rest of the poem. The connotation of the word wild really gives us a sense of what we're expecting of this particular location uh, and how it has been abandoned or left to its own devices therefore it is you know becoming wild as opposed to being restricted and looked after like what we would expect an you know flourishing orchard to be but basically we need to understand also and bring about an image of an orchard we think of an orchard as somewhere that is quite plentiful somewhere that is flourishing somewhere that depending on the type of orchard that it is has plentiful amount of that fruit on the trees and within the orchard um, we wouldn't necessarily imagine an orchard to be very bare and sparse the other thing we need to think about is the images in this poem are meant to evoke some kind of response so Slessor is particularly being evocative and he's really trying to evoke you to consider the way we perceive our memories, the way we perceive our experiences and how that reflection over time can change the way we view it or how our experiences might change over time. So we're getting this sense early on from the title that there's wild grapes. Let's look further into what that might mean. So looking at stanza one, the old orchard full of smoking air, full of sour marsh and broken boughs is there but kept no more by vanished mulligans or hartigans, long drowned in earth themselves, who gave this bitter fruit their care. So we can see that um, we have, I've underlined obviously repetition of old, that comes up later in the poem, but we have this repetition of full. So full of smoking air, so like the dust settling, post a fire, we have that sense of smoking air, full of sour marsh and broken boughs. So... It's now just this kind of um, marshland. It is broken boughs, so like the trees are all fallen down. And it's not what it used to be like. Um, so we have a reference to also the caretakers of these particular orchards. So mulligans or hartigans. It's kind of like who can't quite remember who they are, but you know, it's giving that allusion to a, a certain people who would have owned it. And they've long drowned in earth themselves. So we're told explicitly in that metaphor that they have died. 
who gave this bitter fruit their care. So we have this link here to bitter. And again, that's a bit of a metaphor, this kind of sense of we're getting a bittersweet memory within this poem. But, you know, this idea that the fruit isn't quite nice. It isn't quite what we're expecting. Okay. So moving on into the second stanza. Here's where the cherries grew that birds forgot and apples bright as dog stars. Now there is not an apple or cherry, only grapes, but wild ones. Isabella grapes, they're called. Small, pointed, black, like boughs of musket shot. So the other thing that's important to mention in this poem is this idea of the enjambment. So the fact that we have this running on of lines, we have these longer ideas extended across you know, entire um, stanzas of poetry. And that helps to kind of make this as, you know, this how he is noticing things. So we have to also see that with the lack of punctuation from enjambment, we also can see throughout a lot of um, commas and things like that, which are representative of those pauses that we might have in thinking about a memory or, you know, that time of processing. So we have quite a nice image here to begin with, and it's this um, going back to, you know, a reflection cherries grew that birds forgot we know that orchards have a big problem with birds coming and eating the fruit and we're getting a sense that birds forgot they never knew they existed so we see this kind of flourishing and apples as bright as dog stars so apples that are you know really bright and flourishing and now there is not an apple or cherry only grapes so the apples are gone the cherries are gone we've got these grapes but they are wild grapes okay wild ones so again we have this repetition of wild what is that connotation that comes to mind when we think of wild you know we think of something that is untamed something that is going against um you know expectation that is letting loose out of control so you know are they just being represented as out out of control do we think about that when we think of plants that might be wild and these grapes are called Isabella grapes. They're small, pointed, black, like boughs of musket shot. So they're small grapes, they're pointed, they're black, so they're quite dark grapes. And we have this comparison here to, you know, musket shot, so like the bullets and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, obviously we have this wildness, but then we also have this connotation of, you know, guns and you know, the deadly capacity. So is that a metaphor for the taste of these particular grapes that, you know, they're deadly and quite sweet or sour and bitter? Or is it kind of talking about, you know, something a bit more sinister? So we're getting this introduction to these grapes. And then we move on to stanza three, where it starts by continuing this idea of the grape imagery. So eating their flesh half savage with black fur so again we're starting to see a lot of this you know imagery so eating their flesh um they're half savage so again you know wild savage we're getting continuation of all these quite strong connotative images um and again we have also dead so we're getting a lot of things here that are kind of going hang on a second this isn't just this beautiful flourishing orchard there's this other sinister side to it all so we have here a lot of personification a lot of connotation and a lot of metaphor so he's really Slessor is really trying to capture what is going on through a lot of these figurative devices so yes we can see things quite literally in terms of you know the grapes and what they're going to taste like but making this connection that almost intertwines with the next part so as he's thinking about these grapes and you know acid and gypsy sweet i thought of her isabella the dead girl so again we have this change again a sinister kind of change here who is this isabella you know we've got isabella grapes we've got isabella the girl and we have to we have to keep that in mind that this is about an orchard but it's also about what's happened here and what is this experience that this persona has had? 
So the dead girl who has lingered on defiantly when all have gone away. So his memory of this girl, it's like this ghostly memory, you know, the fact that we can think back to particular times and there can be people who in our memories, they linger. So we have this connection between memories and this lingering in our mind of what has happened. And he's saying she's lingering on defiantly. So it's against what he wants. He doesn't want this to linger. Okay, all his other memories and everything else here in this orchard has gone. But this girl, she's still lingering. Okay, and, you know, she's still lingering this old orchard. So here's our repetition of old, where swallows never stir. So we have this orchard, a place where there's lots of trees. We tend to think that wherever there's trees, we might get different types of birds. And we think about swallows. They're kind of like those small fleeting birds moving around none okay so it's very very um opposite to what we consider in regards to a very flat you know that flourishing um orchard imagery so it's this sense that his memories are kind of haunting him okay the orchard has been abandoned it has been neglected and the other thing we need to consider here with this idea of lingered is the similarity between the fact that these grapes, when they you taste them, they are bitter. Okay, they're savage in their taste. So, you know, that aftertaste lingering in the same way. So, again, we have this really strong kind of parallel, you know, perception of these two things. And then we have the final stanza. So, Isabella grapes, outlaws of a strange bow that in their harsh sweetness remind me somehow of dark hair swinging and silver pins, a girl half fierce, half melting as these grapes, kissed here or killed here, but who remembers now? So we again move into this idea of Isabella grapes, outlaws of a strange bow. So the grapes, they're outlaws, you know, they're on the you know, fringe of society, they're on the um, wrong side of the law, the same way that, you know, and we have this reference to gypsies in the previous stanza. So we again think of gypsies as being kind of on the outskirts of society and things like that. And so these grapes these that have this, you know, very interesting taste, like in their harsh sweetness, remind me somehow of the girl. So is there, was this girl like harsh and sweet? She's half fierce, half melting. So this is where we start to see a lot of paradoxes within this stanza. So we're getting these things that aren't quite making sense and they're kind of contradicting one another. So harsh sweetness, again, what's going on there? And they're somehow reminding us of the girl, half fierce, half melting. So again, we have this idea of someone who is fierce. And when we tend to think of someone who's fierce, we might also have similar description to someone who is wild or someone who is savage in the way that they you know are living their lives but at the same time half melting so you know that sense that someone might make us melt or feel calm or you know fall in love that those kind of things come to mind um but again where that's kind of our simile there a comparison of how she is and the grapes. So again, we have this parallel comparison here. And what we see is he's really struggling to kind of remember what has actually happened. And he's trying to, he can't quite remember his connection to what has gone on. And we see that in this final point where we have these very, you know, you know, charged images. So kissed here or killed here. So that's interesting kissed here so you know did they have you know a romantic experience were they you know a couple together or killed here she died how did she die was he involved what is there something sinister going on here we don't know there is an indication of involvement somehow but there's also this mystery of what actually happened but this sense of but who remembers now and that rhetorical question is kind of like dismissing the whole point. Celeste is saying we don't need to know what 
his involvement was. We don't need to know what has happened because it's now irrelevant because it has gone on so long. And the fact that the orchard has been neglected and the fact that no one's caring for it anymore, it is not as flourishing as it was back when the persona was there previously. So his memory, which is a lingering of Isabella, the girl, also has irrelevance because no one has maintained that. No one is really thinking um, what has happened to her. So it's really this kind of final paradox that we see within this poem that over time memories and they kind of resonate and keep us thinking about things but our connection to that doesn't necessarily continue so we can change our feelings about something that has happened in the past over time as we forget or it becomes irrelevant or it becomes you know not as important so we need to think, is this an anomaly in part of human existence that we continually revise our past and make judgments as to it's okay, it's not okay? And we certainly get that throughout some of the other poems that we have looked at as well. So it's something that we continuously see through Celeste's poetry for this unit that he's really getting the reader to consider what they their involvement in their experience and how memories and time have an impact on that. So we'll have a look at this further in class, but hopefully you can make your annotations and highlight all of the techniques within this poem and we will look at it further in class. Thank you.